flow through this place. Give a double portion of your spirit to this child we will baptize today. And let that spirit flow through all of our hearts that we cannot help but be your people in the world. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> So after the baptism of his baby brother in church, little Joey sobbed all the way home in the car. His parents waited patiently, asking several times, Joey, what's wrong? Finally, Joey calmed down enough to speak. That priest in the sermon today said, he wanted us to grow up in a Christian house. And I want to stay with you and Dad. <laughs> While we may hope that we are living lives worthy of the name Christian, on any given day we could all be outed by those who live closest to us, even our own children who don't really notice the struggle that we have to be Christ's own in the world, and such is the challenge of the Christian life. Today we baptize Elliot Erickson Hurley here at St. John's. He was born this, into this world on November 4th, and he will live out his life on this planet growing and walking, talking, studying, working, loving among us. But today, February 8th, he is also born may be better said reborn by the Spirit or even grafted into the community of faith, claimed as Christ's own in the world through our rite of initiation, baptism. Now, I believe that each of us are called as Christians to be absolutely present to the world as it is and attentive to the movements of culture and religious sensibilities, to attend to the structures of government and the practical lives of those around us. And we are called to know our own story and to practice our faith so deeply that we dare to reflect on how it is that this Jesus, whom we proclaim, or God, whom we revere, or the Spirit who inspires us, God, by any other name, how God is present and active in our lives and in the world around us. That's our call. And then we are called, in understanding that, to take that message of hope and peace and love out into the world and to nurture it in the next generation. So it does make me wonder about this world into which Eliot has been born and the perspective that he may have about God's activity in the world. And genuinely, there are stories about our world that could discourage anyone. In Africa, Boko Haram has been raining terror on masses of people, men, women, and children, in northern Nigeria and in the contiguous countries of Chad, Niger, and Cameroon. And this war has been going on for over five years. The testimonies of Boko Haram's utter brutality and rampant disregard for human life is almost unbearable to read and impossible to hear. Estimates are that over 500,000 people have died, been senselessly slaughtered, thousands have been imprisoned, many of the young women married off as early as age nine against their will, and yet the young men of the same age conscripted into their army of terror, learning to steal and kill before they ever learned to read or write. Many would ask, where is God in all of this? And it's appropriate for us to ask ourselves as Christians, where are we? and to reflect on where will Eliot be as he grows into this life in Christ. And we also wonder where are the 276 schoolgirls kidnapped last year, and why such impotence is displayed by the governments in the region 
that no authority seems to be able to prevail, and what happened to the UN, and you know, I mean, it's just, it's just true. The world around us is perhaps no more or less violent than it ever was, but we hear about it and see it more. We keep track of it in a better way. Elliot has been born into a world that is connected, really born in the midst of, into the midst of a revolution in how humans relate to each other across space, through satellites, beyond language or culture, with instant photos and, and instant access to music. It really is a different world that Elliot will be growing up in and all of our young people. So first, a New Yorker cartoon. I'll describe it to you. There's a husband and a wife, and they're sitting on this sofa. And the husband is looking down at his feet, forlorn. And it's clear he's had some bad news. And his anxious wife is sitting sort of near him, but not too close, and turned to him on the sofa. And she's speaking, and she says, should we keep talking about it? or calmly go to the internet and get scared to death. <laughs> now, it's not just in medical practice, you know, that we get more information than maybe we can deal with, that we have access to more than we know how to process. I genuinely wonder if in this world we do not have too much access to all kinds of information, but not enough capacity to absorb it, process it, to integrate it into our decision making, to make adjustments to our behaviors, and even to guide our institutions, the church being one of them. But it is this world around us into which Elliot has been born. I mean, 50 years ago, Brian Williams probably would not have had to worry about answering the questions of servicemen in Iraq about the truthfulness of his small story where he exaggerated or more about being shot down in a helicopter when in fact he had only witnessed the event. But such are the times into which Elliot was born and into which our children are growing up. So why did I begin the sermon this way? Because, you know, I really think that our times are much like the 15th and 16th centuries at the time of our religious reformation um, that the church is now changing too because everything around us in the culture is changing. And also because I think Eliot, by virtue of his baptism, will be called upon to communicate the good news of great joy, a message of hope, a message of peace and reconciliation to those among whom he lives on this planet. And he will, born in 2014 likely see the turn of the next century into, into the 22nd century. And so I think it's good that we reflect on what it is we're doing to help him proclaim that message. The church has the power to make a difference when we are paying attention. And we have the capacity to nurture our young in ways that empower them to be a force a force for love, a force for good in the world. So that actually is why we're here today, to initiate Elliot into the force. Now, there are some who would say that Jesus is only a good teacher and a role model for our lives, and that by attentively studying about him and what he did, and reading and studying what he said, that we can all be guided to a better life. To be sure, we need role models. And we need examples like that of the saints, both saints with a capital S and small saints, the people in our lives who have touched our lives. We need them to help us answer the crucial questions of how do I act and how should I be in the world? But frankly, I'm with the Apostle Paul. That which we would we do not, and that which we would not, we do. We are hopelessly perverse. Role modeling only goes so far to address our pernicious capacity 
to fall quickly into wrong action, or to choose ourselves over someone else, or to choose violence when we could choose another way. You know, it is not only Boko Haram or the Islamic State that chooses violence. Do y'all know about the Stanford study? Anyone here know about the Stanford study? A group of random people, all apparently decent and healthy human beings with no history of violence are recruited for a psychological study to learn more about the interactions in prisons. And so, they do this giant role play, and they are placed in a physical structure of a prison, and some are assigned to be prisoners, and others are assigned to be the guards. Well, literally within a very few days, the guards, almost to their own horror, engage in acts of violence against the prisoners. The power of the structure and the roles overwhelmed any higher calling for benevolence or kindness or compassion or even rational behavior. So although there may be vast changes in the way we live our lives that are happening on this planet, particularly at this almost time of a communications revolution, some things really don't change that much. And one of those things would be the humanity that we share. That hasn't changed much in the thousands of years that we've been on this planet. That is the humanity that Eliot will encounter in himself and all around. Role model Jesus doesn't begin to touch that part of us, does it? We need a power that is greater than the urgings of our amygdala, our reptilian part of our brain that was programmed over the years during the long eons of our hunter-gatherer life. We need a force of love to infuse a different way in our lives. We need our God, who is greater than we are, whose love for us in Jesus Christ can penetrate our core and literally change our capacity. We come here today as Christians to baptize Eliot because fundamentally we know our need to be transformed by a power that is greater than ourselves. Eliot may never stand alone in front of a tank on, uh, in a place like Tiananmen Square, or lead a march across a bridge over a river into a city that is limiting the rights of their people to have a say in their government. But he may. This thing that we are doing today called baptism can have a powerful effect and propel some to a kind of courage and capacity for action that goes beyond what would be in their own self-interest. Sometimes a mere gesture or a small act can change a mind or the course of history. Eliot or any other of our young people in this parish may do something simple like sitting down in the front of a bus <coughs> or offer a seat at the table to someone who is an outcast or speak up when someone is being hazed or abused, something seemingly small that has great capacity to shift a conversation, to let in some light, and let there be a truth for others to see about how all of us are deeply valued by the God who created us. The power of this ritual today may draw him into this life and embolden him in a way to actually act as Christ's own in the world, to be the feet and the hands of Jesus. And I personally hope for Eliot and even for all of us that as we contemplate this Christian life, I hope we will, not just because Jesus modeled it, but because we have apprehended a power to be better than we otherwise would be, I hope we will appropriate the self-sacrificing love of God in Jesus Christ 
that will allow us to give away enough of our resources for others and for the world that we will know that we are choosing the life that often others have chosen for us. Now, we are not talking magic here. You know, two nuns were traveling through Europe in their own car, and they stopped in Transylvania and were stopped at a traffic light. And suddenly, this diminutive Dracula jumps on their windshield, on the hood of their car, and starts scratching. And both are surprised and scared. And the driver says to her companion nun, quick, quick, what do I do? And her companion says, turn on the windshield wipers. That'll get rid of the abomination. So the driver turns on the windshield wipers, and they go back and forth. But guess what? The diminutive Dracula grabs onto the windshield wipers and is hissing right in front of the driver. And so she says to her companion, scared out of her wits, now what? So the, the companion says, I've got it. Before we left the Vatican, I filled the windshield washer fluid with wa holy water from the Vatican. And so turn on the, turn on the water and, and let's get rid of this, this demon. So scared and desperate, she turned on the water and it sprayed up and nothing happened. She got a panicked look. She looked down. She had this cross on, you know, and she said, what do I do next? And her friend said, your cross, your cross, get your cross and give him your cross. And so the driver rolled down the window and said, get off my windshield, you stupid idiot. You don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a story. <laughs> So this is a story about casting out demons, you know, exorcisms and all that, so you give them the cross and they're supposed to go away. Instead, this woman, we have a lot of lawyers in here, don't we? <laughs> they give a different kind of cross. Well, suffice it to say <laughs> that the power of this Holy Spirit that we will invoke in a few minutes with water and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit it is not a magical incantation nor some symbolic act. It literally is a conferring of power, a power that we share. It's a joining of forces. It's saying absolutely yes to accepting the bonds of our common humanity that hold us back from being our best selves and yes to the power of God to overcome all our worst tendencies in favor of a life that shares with all other of God's creatures and children love and reconciliation and requires a kind of courage and wisdom that God will provide. It encourages us to share our resources and our hope. Elliot, our world needs that kind of power, now more than ever. So my prayer is that it will be manifest in this community, in each of our lives, and in Elliot's life, the, the new one that we bring to the faith today. Amen. Amen.